A Harvard education consists of what you learn at Harvard while you are not studying. James Bryant Conant. Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth, Cornell, Columbia, Penn, and of course, Yale. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the Ivy League and its role in perpetuating class in America. Is the Ivy League just simply a finishing school for the elite? Or are the Ivy Leagues truly the opportunity for merit to rise to the top of society and to shine? Welcome to Analyzing Finance with Nick. Uh, today, we're going deep into the Ivy League. And with the recent Varsity Blues scandal about five years ago, a lot more data really on the underbelly of how admissions and how se selection to the Ivy League has become more publicly available. And so it gives us a, little, a truly opportunity to kind of deep dive into like the truth behind what's going on at these institutions. I'm going to be full directly transparent. I do have some biases going into this video about the Ivy League. I did not personally go to an Ivy League and was rejected from the Ivy Leagues that I applied to back when I was in high school. However, I have a lot of close friends and colleagues who have gone to Ivy Leagues, whether on the undergraduate or the graduate level. And that is kind of my perspective on this. Also, back when I was working in finance, a lot of the top investment firms were a lot pickier on academic resumes. And so I had my applications thrown out a lot simply for just simply not going to an Ivy League school. I've managed to advance in my career despite being from a quote-unquote non-target. But nonetheless, if I have some of my biases on the Ivy League against them, that might be why. So first of all, when it comes to getting the Ivy League, how much of it is privilege versus how much of it is merit? Well, historically, going to college, especially before the GI Bill in World War II, was privilege. And so therefore, Ivy Leagues didn't have to be that selective. If you had the money to go to the Ivy League, they would let you in. Even the Harvards and the Yales had admission rates above 50% for most of the first half of the 20th century. However, as college got more democratized and became more valuable of a status symbol, the, the value of an Ivy League degree went up and the demand for an Ivy League degree went up without really classroom sizes expanding. And so as a result, it became increasingly more selective. And in the Cold War, an era of equality and equal opportunity was highly prioritized. The Ivy League's got a lot of pushback for favoring old money. And as a result, the Ivy League instituted a lot of policies such as affirmative action and just in general prioritizing people from first generation college backgrounds or non-traditional backgrounds or just selecting more based on academic merit than on social privilege and connections. However, even on paper, if the Ivy League tries to brand itself purely as a merit-based institution, the reality really is not the case. However, at the same time, it's not purely a finishing school. Uh, you have to have top grades to get into an Ivy League school, even as a legacy student. So how do people get into Ivy League schools? Like it's not just perfect GPA and SATs because there are thousands of applicants who have perfect GPAs and SATs who are rejected from the Ivy League universities. So it's a mix of academic performance, but it's also driven by well-roundedness variables, which could mean whatever the admission directors want them to mean. And so as a result, you have opportunities to allow old money or the elite to get their way in due to just having a more interesting background or being more well-rounded. Like participation in certain costly extracurriculars are a way to help screen out lower classes into the Ivy Leagues. You also, the upper classes are allowed to, are available to hire tutors to help increase their student, their descendants' grades. Um, there's the legacy factor, where the legacy admission is basically if your parents or grandparents went to an Ivy League school, then you have 
preferential treatment on your application of getting into the Ivy League school. doesn't mean you will get in, but it increases your odds. And it's about 15% of the student body at Ivy League schools are legacy students. If you look at the overall wealth distribution of Ivy League students, it's over 60% are in the top one family of so the top 1% of income. So it's about 650,000 USD or more per year. And then on top of that, you also have other more informal ways you can buy your way into the school. As revealed in Operation Varsity Blues, the minimum bid essentially, if you want to have a donation that they won't even guarantee it, but it will give you your stu your kid extra consideration of getting into the school. It's about 10 million USD. So if you donate 10 million USD to the school to finance some new wing or to increase the endowment or provide a new scholarship fund or whatever, your kid is going to have a better chance of getting into the Ivy League school. I remember back when I was in school, I heard rumors like on the scuttlebutt that it was like one to two million. But like as of 2019, when the last kind of data quote unquote came out about this, it, it increased to about 10, which is the general increased competition of getting into these selective universities. The other real pipeline at Ivy League schools are the elite boarding schools, which I will do a separate video about St. Midas schools because their their whole history and their backstory is very interesting. And if you're not familiar, these are some of the elite boarding schools such as St. Paul's and Deerfield that have a disproportionate pipeline to the Ivy Leagues. They're more likely to have major world leaders, politicians, business leaders, and other elites attend these schools. These are on the West Coast schools like Robert Louis Stevenson, Kate, and Thatcher. And if you went to one of those schools, 33% chance of getting into the Ivy League. Whereas if you went to public school in the United States of America, you have less than 1% chance of getting into the Ivy League. The other thing is funneling through sports that often have higher costs to participate, whether that's rowing or equestrian or sailing or fencing, a lot of these, like they don't give academic scholarships. So you still got to pay full tuition. But if you're a good athlete at some of these more obscure, but financially prohibitive sports, it can also increase your odds. And so that's how old money and elites even if they may not qualify solely just based on grades or academics, or even if they do just to stand out against the sea of middle-class students who also have those level of grades and academic performance can slide in through these workarounds that I mentioned here. And because they have these loopholes around, it's allowed the Ivy Leagues to have it both ways. They can have half of their student body be there solely on merit so that they still have the best and the brightest going to the schools legitimately. And then they have the other half be the elites who are elite through old money or privilege or political connections. And so you get the both the worlds. You get the elites that are going to be elite no matter where they went to school. And you have the elites who you have the raw brain power and the potential that you can train through your education to become the next generation of new money elites. So that's kind of how they do this sort of hybrid model. So yeah, if they're in an Ivy League school, chances are they're very bright and they're qualified. But at the same time, there's also a disproportionately high chance that they are old money. And those are not necessarily mutually exclusive because the elites often got elite due to their intelligence and work ethic and other factors. Does it just apply to Ivy League schools or to other elite institutions as well? Well, it also applies to some of the other elite institutions in the United States, such as Stanford, MIT, and the University of Chicago, where over 40% of students in the top 1% of wealth in the United States, who, but who are also in the top 99 percentile of SAT scores, got into Ivy League schools. Whereas that same level of qualification for middle class people is less than 10%. So there is, again, if you are equally qualified, 
the tie break kicker is going to be social status and wealth. And it's the similar in the UK where private school students are about six to seven percent of the student body, but they're about a third of Oxford students. And that's just kind of a reflection of the role of social class and privilege still in the Ivy Leagues. And now we talked about getting into the schools. Let's talk about now the outcomes and the results of people coming out of the Ivy League schools. When it comes to outcomes, let's first start with the political class. Depending on if you count people who've dropped out of Congress recently or not, approximately 13 to 15 percent of members of Congress, House and Senate, um, have an undergrad or a graduate education from an Ivy League school. Compare that to less than 1% of the overall population of college graduates in the United States. And college graduates even are less than 40% of the population. So that shows really how concentrated a political power really is among the Ivy Leagues. And you have similar high proportions among many state governor level and um, the lobbyist class. The Supreme Court is the most extreme concentration of Ivy Leagues. Currently, all nine sitting Supreme Court justices either attended Harvard or Yale Law School. And eight of the nine justices received undergraduates from Ivy Leagues as well. When it comes to presidents, there's been a varied academic history, but by far the leading schools for presidents to be alumni are have been Ivy League schools, particularly Harvard and Yale. And if you look at basically presidents since Ronald Reagan, so like in my lifetime, basically every president until Joe Biden had either had gone to an Ivy League university for undergrad or graduate. That includes Clinton, George Bush Sr., George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and um, Donald Trump. And if Harris wins, she will be the only the second president in the last 40 years to have not gone to an Ivy League institution for undergrad or graduate school. The Ivy League bias also extends into the business world. When it comes to CEOs of publicly traded companies, um, the percentage is quite substantial. Approximately 11% of Fortune 500 company CEOs have an Ivy League degree. When you consider top MBA programs, 40% of Fortune 100 CEOs have graduated from a top 10 MBA program. Not all those are Ivy League, but I include Stanford really as an honorary Ivy League for the purposes of this video because it effectively is. It doesn't really just apply to climbing the corporate ladder. When you include Stanford, the Ivy Leagues and Stanford dominate startup funding. When it comes to undergraduates, Stanford has alone 1,427 alumni founders who have raised venture capital in the last decade. If you include their business school, that number goes up to 4,000. Uh, you see Berkeley as the top spot for undergrads with a little over 1,800, but UC Berkeley is no slouch. It ranks higher academically in prestige versus at least three, if not four, of the Ivy League institutions. Outside of Berkeley, MIT, and Stanford, the remaining top 10 universities for start founders are all in the Ivy League, with Harvard ranking second and University of Pennsylvania ranking fifth. When it comes to other statistics that point to the distribution of startup concentration, in the elite universities, you have, in terms of unicorn founders, Stanford is the leader, of course. Stanford founders are 1.6 more times more likely than an average uh, founder to receive venture capital backing to achieve unicorn status. Yale is the highest probability. Yale alumni are two times more likely to achieve unicorn status than other venture-backed startup founders from other universities. 53% uh, of unicorn founders have degrees from the top 10 global universities, which includes Stanford and most of the Ivy League schools. 
And on top of that, let's just look at billionaires as a whole. There's a disproportionate amount of billionaires who are alumni of either Ivy League schools or Stanford. If you just exclude Ivy League dropouts or people who attended Stanford, just Ivy League graduates, 70 of the top 400 um, richest people on the Forbes list went to an Ivy League school. That is about a little less than 20%. I'll put the exact number in a text quote here. When it comes, if you include Stanford alumni and Ivy League dropouts, that number goes up to a little under 26% of the Forbes 400 billionaires or, or will go to one of those schools. Harvard has the most billionaire alumni with 15. University of Pennsylvania has 14. And Yale and Stanford have 12 billionaires each. And the only Ivy League school not to have a billionaire alumni is Brown. And then outside of the Forbes 400, there are also a lot of old money families who have Ivy League degrees overall. Just given the fact you have legacy admissions and that, yeah, and as you look at and if you look at ultra high net worth individuals overall, which by the definition of my source for this, which is Business Insider, they have at least $30 million in net worth. Harvard alone has 1,906 ultra high net worth individuals with a combined net worth of $811 billion. And this kind of strengthens the idea of the correlation between Ivy League attendance and success after. And it's not really just the pure business world and politics. Like the top NGO slots, leading think tank people. If you look at academics, like 80% of college professors at the US News Top 50 have at least one degree from an Ivy League or Stanford in their undergraduate. So even most professors of the less prestigious schools but still the top of the top in america all have ivy league degrees so it's kind of a closed shop a lot of it is connections but a lot of it also is that these are some of the smartest people in america and i think it's a combination of both merit and elitism which has been able to perpetuate ivy league alumni as effectively one of the crucial parts of the ruling class and that's why in my America old money chart, I did have a specific class called the Ivy League professional class, which was the one right below the establishment elite. And the numbers that I show here and the process on how these people are getting into these schools kind of just explains why they are a class of their own. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach out. If you went to an Ivy League school and agree or disagree with me and please comment if you think hopefully i made a fair representation here to really kind of analyze the assessment of this and uh, thank you for watching